the learning hack is supported by a new spring, the platform that puts the learner first, shaping journeys that help individuals learn faster and perform better. Access intelligent technology, profound insights and a unique network of like-minded pioneers. And if you're a trainer or training provider looking to succeed in this fast-changing market, their free ebook will show you how putting the learner first is the key to winning. Download it now at anewspring.com slash learner first. That's anewspring.com slash learner first. LMS, LXP, LRS, TRS, HRIS. Everybody's got a platform nowadays, haven't they? But how do you tell which is the one for you? Well, the answer to that question, as with railway platforms, will depend on where you want to go, obviously. But also, it might depend on where you are. Welcome to The Learning Hack, a podcast about the people and technologies that are creating the future of learning. I'm John Hellman. Now, guess what? Learning is learning cool. Is cool. cool. Learning is cool. Learning is cool. Learning is fun. And knowledge is power. Knowledge. Education. I'm talking to you from Brighton on the south coast of England, which is one of the constituent nations of the United Kingdom, part of the continent of Europe, in the northern hemisphere of the planet Earth, in the solar system, the galaxy, the universe, and so on. For a time in the pandemic, the specificity of place ceased to be important because during that period, we all lived on Zoom. Distance dissolved, geography seemed to recede in importance. But then came a shock, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia that reminded us rather brutally of the fact that geography matters, that where you are on the map, where your customers are, where your employees and partners are, is not something you can just take for granted. Back in August, I travelled to Ukraine and talked to a CEO whose company is based in Odessa. More recently, I talked to a CEO whose headquarters are even closer to the Russian border, though he's based in a NATO country, Finland. Kate Fitzgerald, Head of Fact, tell us more about our guest this time. Fact Facts. Yussi Herskainen is CEO and co-founder of Thalamis. Founded in 2003, the company has offices in the US and India and several locations in Europe. It is headquartered in Genshu in Finland, not far from the Russian border. The company's flagship product, the Valimis Learning Experience Platform, LXP, uses learning data in an unprecedented way and has been recognised by top industry analysts. In my consulting work, I've talked to a lot of LearnTech platform providers I've even worked for a few of them, but I have to admit it is not always easy to see what makes one learning platform any different from all the others. Valimis regularly turns up in analysts' lists of companies to watch, so clearly has something special going for it. In my chat with UC, I wanted to find out the ingredients of that special sauce. But also, I had a Finnish grandmother, and I have an interest in the region and its Cold War history, which is where the title of this episode comes from, Finlandization. I wanted to know what it's been like running a learning company 50 kilometres from the Russian border over the last few years. So you see Horst Kainen, I had a good crack at it there. <laughs> it's great to have you on the podcast. Welcome to The Learning Hack. Thank you, thank you. You're the CEO and co-founder of Falamis. For people who don't know the company yet, what products and services do you supply and what is the value you provide for your customers? Uh, Falamis is a corporate learning platform. Uh, We do external and internal cases, so mainly professional services and then uh, manufacturing external cases. Uh, We make learning measurable and connect to business results. Those have been the things that people have been interested about us. And the other thing is that career planning tool, career burst, that is a nice addition for this. And we have service company background. So we bootstrap this company and that gives the service attitude what we have been bringing to customers. So Partner in learning is kind of the slogan nowadays. Okay. 
uh, I'd like to talk more about that aspect, but um, before we do that, uh, the analyst picture. You're you're rated a core leader by Fosway in their nine grid for learning systems. And they, they said this about the learning systems market in February of this year. Market growth continues to be driven by increased investment from buyer demand, but both corporates and vendors are increasingly trying to preempt the consequences of imminent recession. There is still evidence of growth in many sectors, but some vendors are already anticipating a global economic slowdown, reducing costs, including staff numbers. Others, though, are expanding, including moving into new regions. This is increasing competition within Europe, especially in the already very busy mid-market. So you see as a mid-market player, how has their prediction panned out in 2023? I, I know, incidentally, you must know about Fosway because you have a, an office in Sirencester where they are based. Um, so how, how does that prediction of theirs accord with your experience in 2023? Are you one of the companies that's growing or among those drawing in their horns, consolidating? Long question, I'm afraid. Long question, but important one. Um, market has been what what they expected, that in Europe there is a downturn of slowness in buying, but in USA and Brazil, where we have operational, it has been as, as busy as before, so new customers coming from there. Uh, European market, slower, and uh, but, but customers are still signing and uh, we have a good platform that can create value and replace multiple systems at the same time. So you can unify LXP, LMS, uh, LRS, use in internal and external case, the same platform. So that has been a key there. Mm. And at the same time, we also have, ha have been one of those companies that have been cutting spending. Uh, we also had to cut down staff and uh, remove costs wherever possible. I think quite many companies that are competing with us are doing the same at the same time. Yeah. Another part of the Fosway analysis there is how crowded uh, the mid-market is for learning systems. And I was very yeah. struck by this when I, I talked to Fosway on, on their stand at uh, French conference uh, around that time, February. And um, both uh, Fiona and David were saying, you know, the, the mid-market is a difficult place to be. It's very crowded. Uh, there are so many systems, and I was conscious of this with my work with Go One as well. Uh, a lot of them seem to do roughly the same things. How do you, how do you differentiate in, in such a crowded market? How would you characterize Alamis' uniqueness in, in that? Or do they are you very much like them or different? Of course, we have to have our unique point also. It's crowded market and everything looks the same on the outside that you have basically the same functionality in 10 different platforms. And But what difference us is that, yeah, I, mean, I have an engineering background. So, so everything is uh, very data oriented from the beginning. The whole product is very data oriented. We use uh, standards wherever possible. We give transparency of data to customers that has helped many of them. For example, one of the customers, uh, Valtec, that is a French company, but LED is located in Denmark. And they have used a lot of our data, our data that Valamis has produced uh, in internal processes that have led to significant savings in work amounts and the cost of learning. and. Time to competence is kind of the thing what we are aiming for. And you use XAPI? Yeah. yeah. Do you also get into sort of external data from, from the company so that you're able to kind of look at um, outcomes as, as against number of people who, who took the training? Yeah, typically we connect to ERP systems or CRM systems, for example, uh, Salesforce or so, that you, you have a and B testing done that you have people who got the training and people who didn't get the training or before the training and after the training. What are the, for example, uh, installations, how they are going, how many reclamations come up and so on. Hmm. Is that a difficult ask in some companies? Because I, I, I've heard this come up before that when it comes to evaluating training, uh, you know, you want a control group. You want a, a group of people who didn't take the training. And... 
um, people will say, well, if we think this training is going to work, why wouldn't we give it to everyone? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, that's the target. But rollouts, where you where, where you roll out things, that, that you have one country that takes the train one month before, or so on. So at least you can see that before they had this situation, after it was this, and on the other group who didn't take the training, nothing changed at the same time. So it's nothing else like that you have to. But if you do it that way, how do you disentangle country differences from? Don't you, you know, to be purely scientific, yeah, 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 yeah. You have to do a kind of AB of the, the an identical, more or less identical um, cohort. Yeah, yeah, identical cohorts are difficult. Like, uh, what is purely identical? But similarity is that do you see a change when you, for example, uh, take ten hour training on something like installation and uh, one I one customer in mind, I don't mention them, but but like they are doing Europe-wide installation to homes. And uh, there we can see clear difference for untrained groups and retrained groups. So when the manufacturer has new information that this, these are the typical errors that you make or the groups, groups who install make and it's complex product. So having five hour session to get rid of the usual mistakes that shows up in data significantly. And so it's not cultural thing anymore. Yeah. So data is a big part of the story. Yeah. Moving more to the kind of front end of the solution, as it were, the, the LXP category has been much kicked around over the last few years by analysts um, and has come in from a kicking from some quarters. Um, but one aspect I've, I've always found interesting is, is how a recommendation system uh, like an LXP deals with the wide spectrum of learner agency we see in organizations. But what I, I mean by that is LXPs tend to emphasize how learner-driven they are. You know, the learners we control here uh, and, and we can target things towards what we know the, 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 the learner needs or the learner would be interested in. But learners often don't have that much choice. Um, they often have to do a lot of man mandated learning. Uh, they don't have, have have any kind of agency really it's just you know the, the, the organization needs you to do this and there are kind of many points in between where you might have um here's a training course about leadership uh here are some resources that you might be interested in although they're not mandated as part of the course so you'll have a mix of mandated and non-mandated how do you deal with that how does your system deal with that range of requirements um i know how learning pool deals with this but I'm interested in, in how, how you deal with it. Mm, our approach, of course, we have mandated learning. That That's based of every, that if you want to call yourself self a learning platform, you have to have LXP and LMS functionality, that freedom of learning that you, you do it by yourself or what is mandated by the company. But in the between area, its audience is, is the functionality what we by using that you have organizational data, skill data, personal data on people. And you say that everybody who belongs to HR organization in India needs to do this. But at the same time, who have this skill level or everybody around the globe who are interested in this subject will see this. Like, so it's um, Boolean mathematics, basically. Uh, mm -hmm. You are... And uh, so we can create quite uh, uh, structured variety without going into organizational structure itself. That who are interested, who have this, who have shown interest in this, who have done this before, or who company would like to do more about it. So that's so, the way how we build it. Uh, so the answer is maths. I think my question. Maths, is. maths, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. But there's one good way of shutting the interviewer up when the interviewer is an English grad who doesn't know that much about maths. <laughs> um, on the subject, though, you know, more serious, I suppose, of, of, of data. And obviously, data is a big part of your 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 system. Um, can you talk about uh, the part that AI plays for you, mm -hmm. um, and the part you see it playing in the future? And is generative AI any part of that? Yeah, yeah, we are working on multiple fronts with AI. And I think 
what we are aiming to have with AI, that it's not see, something subtle that you don't practically notice, but good algorithms that help you to understand what's important, uh, what, what is the upcoming things. And uh, that's because we have a lot of data collected and we have uh, good algorithms based on the like billions of rows of data that we have collected throughout, throughout the years. Uh, but what we are doing with generative AI, we are only using that in content creation. We have Lesson Studio that you can create content with, and that is integrated to ChatGPT. So you can create content with the, its assistant kind of level currently. We are working on that. But we don't let outside generative AI touch on personal data. That's clear difference. And that we need to resolve before we start using anything generative AI on personal data. I personally don't trust that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, we pretty good reason. Yeah. That, that is a story I've heard from, from other uh, similar systems as well, is that, that, that generative is used in the content creation, not so much in the other yeah. stuff. So the AI, the AI is used in the recommendations, yeah? Recommendations and uh, notifications, especially on notifications based on the audience is what we discussed just a couple of minutes ago, that yeah. something that you should do or you must do, but doing it so that it doesn't, it's, uh, it's timely and it's good for you. And it's not like, let's say least painful way. <laughs> like if you have want to have or must have mandatory training, what is the least painful way of having it? That is the way our algorithms hit. And then we go to the LED personal that uh, help them to understand where the problem might be or what they should add and this kind of thing. So content, content side and the uh, learner analysis, basically. Uh, it's interesting that you've got al algorithms choosing the least painful way you learn something. Twitter's algorithms seem to make you take the most painful route of discovering yeah, yeah. things about various things and really manage it for five minutes at a time. No. Yeah. So uh, changing the subject slightly, acquisitions have formed an important part of your development story. Um, and I believe in the, at the very beginnings of that, I'm a bit fuzzy about that. So I, I, you know, <laughs> please if you can fill me in about that. I know a little about the working manager acquisition, the, the acquisition of the company called the working manager, because I've known Phil Berber for a number of years. Can you talk us through the logic behind these purchases and the effect that they have had on the evolution of Philanis? Yeah, we have had multiple acquisitions throughout the years. And every time there has been some like exact need for it. For example, TWM case, it was uh, penetration UK market and having visibility over there. Mm -hmm. That was the theme. And reasoning, yeah, 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 we can talk about prices and uh, how things are organized, but that's never the case. It's always about the people who come with the organization that would this work? Are they good people? What we could build next? And this is the most important things for me when deciding that is this a match that we should focus on? Should we spend time on acquiring something and integrating everything? Because it's big hassle always, and you always lose people and so on. But and most you, you need to fail, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And how to make it work is that you decide beforehand that you have to have strong opinion. It will it work with these people or not? Like the people itself. I think mean, everything else is uh, subjective to that. But I've um, I, I've heard entrepreneurs talk about well, we'll do some acquisitions that you do are for kind of visibility in certain markets, or we're mm. you know we're buying clients, or we're taking out a competitor. Others are to develop our solution. Um, mm. Has that played a part in it? You, you seem to say it's more about kind of acquiring people. But... Um, there's market, there's people. With TWM, it was carry burst also, that we get add-on onto the product. 
but we get more understanding, like increasing the understanding through people and the customers and the markets. I think that that is often the case. Yeah. Did TW bring you in kind of LMS capability to backfill, as it were, the LXP capability? Is that or is that crude too crude? Um, we had practically the same stuff, but I think they were stronger in events function, like, the, like uh, blended learning approach. Yeah. And uh, that we have been integrating now, or be, rebuilding to the Volumes platform based on the information, what we learned with the DW. The Learning Hack podcast is supported by Learning News, the learning sector's newswire. Rob and his team are good friends of the podcast, and we really value the help and advice we've had from them, and they do a great job. For the very latest news from around the learning sector, for interviews with learning leaders, the latest from learning sector vendors and features on workplace learning, go to learningnews.com. And going further back, um, I, my knowledge is a bit sketchy here, but I'm, am I right in thinking you, you kind of got into learning tech through an acquisition? Is, is that right? Or have I got all that garbled? Um, weren't originally a learning company, in other words. But new partner joined the company. Jari Järvela, who is our chief visionary officer, who is behind the product. And we were a service company at the time, so that we were doing all, all kind of web projects. And uh, Jari had strong learning background, work in university, worked as an entrepreneur and so on. And when he joined our organization, we did a couple of projects for the customers. And then we open sourced everything, what we built. Mm. And that led to birth of Valamis, the product that uh, uh, we open sourced it. We participated in some contest and we ended up winning best marketplace application and flew to California. And there were a hundred people who had read our code who wow. said that this is, <laughs> this is like people from NASA and people from New University of New York and so on. They had read our code and they said to us that, would it be possible that you would continue doing this and we would pay something <laughs> for you? And I'm like, yeah. Maybe, maybe. And that led to the birth of Valamis, the product. And so. That's an amazing story. It's, yeah. And this is something I, I really don't know about. Do people at NASA go around reading the code of learning systems? Uh, that we had that open source. So it was visible and shared to the... Source, yeah, there, there are other open source systems around, aren't there? Like Tatar. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And they particularly liked your code. That's an amazing validation. Yeah, it was funny to hear that in San Francisco that uh, yeah. you had hundreds of Americans coming up right one after other and explaining that your code is magnificent and you should continue doing it. <laughs> so. so personally for you, what's been your kind of journey in, into learning? How did you come to be in the position where you're, you're now CEO of a learning tech company? Um, I'm an entrepreneur. I've been CEO of this company for, well, since I was 25, so 20 years now. And like like I just explained, like we were a service company that mm -hmm. evolved to product company uh, throughout the project that we did with the learning. And Jari Arvela was very influential on that, that he had experience on the subject. He started explaining to like took the kid that <laughs> this yeah. is how it uh, goes and it's not schools this is like corporate uh, corporate learning yeah. and uh, so i've been in that journey now like 12 years yeah so uh, i evolved through the experience yeah so you had a fast learning curve no pun intended you know with it with yeah. this ministry. How did you find, what was your reaction to, to what you discovered when you, you, you got into learning tech? Does it seem a very distinct sector for all the others? You know, I, I've been kind of working in it for a couple of decades, so I'm, I'm kind of yeah. used to it. But it still seems slightly bizarre to me as a business sector, as a software sector. What are your reflections on that? 
It has a lot of variations globally that education systems are different, cultures are different, so it varies throughout the world. But at the same time, it has so many similarities. And then when you have this, this pedagogy applied to technology, then it becomes interesting. And I think my point was the data. That yeah. I was interested about the numbers. I was interested about the roles and going through them and seeing what's the big, big picture behind the numbers. And yeah. that that got me interested in learning, like like really interested about it. Yeah. Because there is a lot of science in, in learning. Yeah. Um, you know, more in some places than others. Isn't it? Mm. So a, another massive change of subject, sorry about this, EC, but um, we've all been operating in a very disrupted landscape over the last few years, uh, in particular the pandemic, which had its good sides for e-learning, but uh, a bit of a shock in terms of not having anyone in the office anymore, followed by a big shock to the region where you're headquartered in Finland, right on the Russian border, uh, as well as the rest of the world, um, the invasion of Ukraine. How, how has that period been for you? I understand you might not be able to talk that much about it, but but can you give us some idea of how that it, it's felt to go through that shock to the region? A, a lot of people don't necessarily, necessarily appreciate the fact of how close Finland lies to, to Russia and you have that very long border. Yeah, I have lived all my life close to Russian border. Now there's 50 kilometers from the border. I remember when in childhood it was white map that you didn't know anything about it behind, mm -hmm. behind the border. You only saw white map. So it was pretty distant then. But yeah, we had operations inside Russia when the war started. We had unit in Petrosovodsk, 300 kilometers from here, just close, close by university city. I had employees over there, 50 people um, behind the border when the war started. And we, we offered evacuation for everybody. And uh, 30 people came to this side. And um, horrible stuff, what is happening in Ukraine. I feel very strongly about it. And, uh, and we should give all the support what Ukraine needs. Uh, but at the same time, on personal level, Russian people are just people like others. I have Ukrainian work uh, employees here in the UN, so Russian employees working alongside. Mm. And uh, in one company event, I remember that Russian woman was singing zombie, cranberries zombie with Ukrainian guy at the same time. And that felt... That, okay, we are quite close to the situation that we have people from the countries that are in war in singing karaoke together in company event that is about the war. And so I've, I've I often feel thought, closely. I've often thought that karaoke is the, the solution to all our problems. <laughs> seems so. Seems so. Yeah, but more seriously, that does must give you a bit of hope for you know when when all this awfulness is over that there there is possibility of, of healing those breaches if people can sing together. Yeah. Lastly, you see, in the world of learning, who and what are the sources you turn to for for knowledge and inspiration? Mm, uh, this is something that I really thought about, like. What are the actual sources? And I seem to be like other growth company leaders and founders. Of course, those are the people that I look up to a lot. But at the same time, it's uh, often historic figures like uh, uh, Alexander the Great or Crazy Horse from Lakota tribe and so on. Yeah. So those people really inspire me. And uh, I have always been a history fan and read a lot of books, listen to podcasts, I read articles, that's and right. of course, to talk to people. Like, uh, I think that's my way. Yeah. So crazy horse. And yeah, I, I don't think it's worth us putting links to those people in show notes because it's all on Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, thanks for taking the time to do this today. Um, I really value the opportunity to, to talk to you. 
Um, Thalamus is a is, is a really interesting company. I think um, we wouldn't have you on otherwise because we're not you know we don't do kind of random plugs for learning systems yeah. companies. Yeah. Uh, but thanks a lot for taking the time to the UC. Thank you for inviting me. That's all on the Learning Hack podcast for this time. Many thanks to our guest and to our sponsors. The Learning Hack is completely independent and transparently funded by sponsorship. If you want to help others find us, please like, follow, rate, review and subscribe on your podcast platform of choice or on YouTube. A new season of our sister podcast, Great Minds on Learning, has launched. The first episode is on evaluation. So why not head over there and listen, rate, review, comment and above all, subscribe. Until next time. Stay curious, learning people.